Good morning. I'm Digvir Jais, Vice President of Research and International at the University of Manitoba. I am very pleased to welcome you uh, uh, all to this 15th Annual Science, Engineering and Technology or SAT Day. Uh, it is our first ever uh, online presentation of SAT Day. It's not quite the same as we usually do this event, uh, but we have adapted just as you have adapted your learning to virtual means. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, uh, I can't see all of the participants, uh, but typically for this event, we have uh, close to 200 participant, participants joining, uh, and I welcome each one of you. Uh, those of you who are joining certainly from within the city limits, but also those who are joining from outside the city limits. And in the past, we certainly have had participants uh, not only within Manitoba, but also from Ontario. So I welcome each one of you. Uh, and I certainly hope you would have a uh, enjoyable day and also would find it very great learning experience. Uh, many of you may not know, the University of Manitoba is our province's uh, largest and only research intensive university. Uh, it has been at the center of research in Manitoba over, uh, for over a century. Uh, today, much of the research done in Manitoba takes place on one of our campuses or at our research and field stations. And when you take into consideration all the affiliations the university has, actually all of research in, the, in, in Manitoba has some connection to the University of Manitoba, either the uh, short-term uh, appointment of the scientists working at other, other facilities at the university who conduct research or our scientists working in those research facilities and conducting research. The line of said day talks we have ready for you he, uh, to hear are from researchers encompassing breadth of scientific discovery possible should you choose a career in research. Uh, today, I hope you will be inspired by our speakers and see the potential each of you has to be a great, uh, a great have to be great scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and technologists. Thank you, Megwich. Merci. Welcome to the sad day. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. J.S. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Jay During, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Partnerships here at the University of Manitoba, and I'll be your MC for this morning. You'll be hearing from six set day presenters this morning. Each will present for about 10 minutes, and then that'll be followed by a 10-minute Q&A. You can post your questions on Slido, uh, and that's appearing on the screen right below me right now. Uh, it'll uh, event 8674, so www.slido.com, and the event number is 8674. There'll be a 10 minute break uh, after the three presenters, and then we'll resume, and that should be a uh, resumption around 10 a.m. So let's jump right into it and get to the first set day presenter, Dr. Cheryl Glazebrook. Her presentation is entitled Lights, Motion Capturing Camera, Action, How Studying Actions Give Us Insight Into How Our Brain Works. Cheryl is an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Recreation Management at the University of Manitoba and the Director of the Perpetual Motion Integration Lab. Her research seeks to understand how information from different sensory modalities helps or hinders how humans perform movements. She conducts her research in a continuum from lab-based experiments to applied community-based approaches with a particular interest in understanding the role of sensory motor integration and autism. Over to you, Cheryl.
This is the general outline for the talk today. So I wanted to start off by discussing a little bit about why I was interested in studying movement and then why as a society we're interested in studying movement. I'll briefly introduce how we look at motor control models and think about how it is that humans are able to perform so many different skills. And then I've got two examples for us to, to look at, one focusing on how visual information impacts our movements, as well as how vibrotactile or vibration impacts our movement control. Movement control. So here in this picture is a much younger version of myself. Um, this is a picture from my very first Nutcracker performance. And so I have been a dancer since I was three, and I always loved to dance. And as a dancer, we have to learn and remember long sequences of movements. I think some of the longest pieces I had to learn were 10 to 12 minutes. But we also spend a lot of time refining the quality of how we move. And so I was very interested in, enjoyed teaching dance as well. And so going into university, I was interested in pursuing a career in physiotherapy so that I could help teach people how to move following an injury or in recovery from a disease. And in talking with a family friend who was both a dancer and a physiotherapist, she recommended the field of kinesiology because that as a field focuses on human movement and that really spoke to my, my interest. So I then um, applied and, and went to McMaster to study kinesiology. But in addition to being interested in teaching movement, when I was in high school, I was continuously asking my, my biology and physics teachers, well, how is it that the nervous system is able to send the signals? And well, why, why do things happen that way? And so even from high school, I thought that I would be interested in a research career, but I wasn't quite sure how that path would all, all turn out. So the logical start was to, to start with kinesiology. And as I said, kinesiology looks at studying human movement broadly. And the specific area within kinesiology that I learned about during my undergraduate was motor behavior. And motor behavior looks at how humans control movement, how we learn movement, and even how the development of movement occurs over our lifespan. And so as we watch this video, we can see some of the beautiful and skilled movements that humans are capable of learning. So in order to perform this task, we have to learn the postural control to be able to move so smoothly on the ice. The skater also needs to remember the sequence of movements that he wants to perform. And in order to perform the movements with such skill and grace and emotion requires considerable practice. And we can see that contrast here with somebody's first day learning how to skate. And so humans can learn a wide variety of skills that we use for sport and recreation, but also the skills that we use to learn how to build a computer how to type or write our names, and even the initial skill to tie our shoelaces to be able to participate in skating. So there's a wide range of skills that we need to learn as humans. Now, how do we study movement? The challenge with movement is that we don't have conscious access to those processes, because if we had to think about each individual movement, we would be overwhelmed with thinking about all of the different aspects we need to control. And so we have to have ways of measuring what it is that we're doing without asking people. So to do that, we have a variety of techniques. We can use things like EMG to measure muscle activity or EEG, which allows us to measure brain activity. We can also measure where you're looking. And the focus of today, we're gonna look at how it is that we study movement using three-dimensional motion capture. So in the top picture there, we can see the finger with the two little dots and wires. And what those are, are infrared emitting diodes known as IRETs. And so they emit an infrared signal that we can't see with our naked eye, but that is traveling through the air. And then the camera below that with the three black circles, those are three separate cameras that are integrated so that we can track exactly where that diode is moving through space in X, Y, and Z coordinates. And it also is able to record the rotation on those axes, so pitch, yaw, and roll. And so what we do is we track how those irids move through space. And then from that, we take that displacement and we use that calculus that you have or are going to learn. And we 
then determine the velocity that the limb is moving. We determine the acceleration and even sometimes the jerk. And so when we look at these different parameters, it can give us insights into how people are moving. And so by varying, for example, the task, we can see how some tasks are harder or easier or how we adapt. By varying participants, so for example, if we look at an expert performer moving, like our figure skater there, we can see very smooth trajectories that are very consistent. And then we also vary the sensory information. So in the bottom corner there, we have our very stylish glasses where we're able to, for example, remove visual information very rapidly and see how we're able to, to adjust to that. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples that look at how we vary things like the task and the participant. So if we start at the top of the screen with our eye there, when we go to, for example, reach out and pick up our cup, first thing I do is I look to identify what that goal of my action is. So I want to pick up my cup. And then that information is organized within my brain and the signals are sent down through my brainstem, through my spinal cord and eventually reaching my muscles, allowing for that movement to occur. Now, what's really interesting is that although the visual information is all projected onto our retina within our eye and then sent to the back of our brain to our primary visual cortex, how that information is processed going forward changes. And so the information that we can consciously perceive that we see is processed in a separate stream or a separate pathway within the brain compared to the visual information that we use to update our movements. So not, no need to worry about the words or exact pathways here. But what I wanted to highlight is there is that pathway going down through the brain that sends the signals to the muscles. But then we have a number of feedback loops. So on the side, we can see those different arrows coming back into the system. And that's what allows humans to update and, and correct our movements on the go. And so the purple line there represents that visual information that is processed, but not at a conscious level and allows us to update our movements on the go. So I wanted to start with a, an example of how we investigate these hanging up exactly at the... So we'll just uh, hang tight here for a little bit. Uh, Cheryl's uh, internet has a very predictable habit of hanging up at uh, 901. So uh, let's, uh, let's give it a minute. Uh, I'll just uh, go quiet and there we go. Okay, okay, Cheryl, you did hang up predictably, so uh, I'll pass yeah. it back off to you. Okay, perfect. So the, I was... Oh, I think I was just transitioning into the slide, so I apologize for that. It's some predictable internet brownouts. The first example I wanted to, to discuss today is actually some research that I did as an undergraduate student. And so as an undergraduate student, there can be different opportunities for you to get involved with some of the research at the university. And so for this research, I was a summer student that was uh, fortunate enough to be able to apply and get funding to be able to work in the research lab over the summer. And so the experiment that we did used these visual illusions. And what's interesting about these is even though you know that the illusion happens, you still can't help but perceive that illusion. So what happens is, is when the tails or the wings point outward, we perceive that line to be longer than when the tails point inward. So for this experiment, we had two different tasks. The first task was a perceptual decision task. So we would show you one of these illusions and then we would show you a straight line and ask you to tell us if that line was longer or shorter than the line you had seen. And what was novel or new about this research is we had five different figures. And so we not only had the wings pointing in and out, but we also had the wings pointing left and right. And the reason we did that is that those figures, the line doesn't look any longer, but it shifts our perceived location. And so what we found is that when we asked you to make a perceptual decision, all of these figures in the middle, the wings left, the control, and wings right, were all perceived to be the same length. Whereas for the illusion figures or the traditional illusion figures, we got the predicted bias that we expected. 
Now, then we compared that perceptual task to performing a motor task. So we used that motion capture camera and we had an eye red on the finger and we had people point from one end of the figure to the other end of the figure. And we measured a number of different variables, but the key one I'm going to show here is we measured how far you moved on average for each trial. And what we can see here is that there was a steady change from figure to figure in how we perceived the, the location of the target. And so together what this tells us is, is that we process the visual information differently depending on the task that we're going to use. So that's really interesting because it shows that we're able to, fle we're able to flexibly be able to perceive our environment in a way that is adaptable to the task we're trying to perform. But all of this is done without us being aware of these subtle differences in perception. So the answer to the question, does any perceived bias of the figures depend on the task? So the answer is yes, it does. Now, some of the current work that we're doing in our lab is also using the mirror liar illusion. And this is work that my master's student, Ganesh Taylor, is leading. And now we're interested in understanding more how individual traits might change how it is that we perceive our environment. So one of my favorite sayings that Ganesh will say is, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And the answer is probably not because we all perceive the world in slightly different ways. And so autistic traits have been shown to possibly modulate or change the way in which we see these different illusions. And within the broader population, there's quite a bit of diversity in terms of how we have certain, how we process our world. So two questionnaires that we're doing with this research are looking at our artistic traits because all of us have certain amount of autistic traits, as well as looking at the systemizing quotient. So if you are a high, have a high systemizing way of processing the world, that's more often our engineers, for example, in very systematic way of solving problems. And so we want to see how it is that the way that we perceive the illusions, does that change or depend on some of these individual traits? And so currently, because of our need to conduct our research virtually, we're focusing on perceptual tasks where people are performing very um, specific tasks where they select which target or which figure is longer or shorter, or they're making adjustments so that we can see how the different tasks relate to those individual traits. Now, going forward, we would also like to do this work with the motion caption camera so that we can have people reach out and grasp those different Mueller liar figures and be able to measure the impact of the illusion on how we interact with the object. Now, one of the really interesting... Get, get running out of time there, Cheryl. Okay, I'll just wrap up there. Oops. So one of the really interesting places that our world, our, our field is going is the ability to do markerless motion capture. And so the technology is really growing and expanding, especially with the pandemic and the need to do things virtually in order to be able to do some of this work remotely and by using the camera on our cell phones or computers to be able to do more detailed analysis. So I'll just finish off by talking about the fact that we're also looking at ways that our sense of our limbs are affected. And so my current PhD student is looking at vibration. So vibration is normally thought to impede our ability to know where our limbs are in space. But she's looking at the opportunity to actually use proprioception to support or give us more information about where our limbs are in space. And so again, using the motion caption camera to do that. So just to finish off, the how we perceive and how we move depends on the task, our, it, the individual and our past experiences. And studying how humans move can help us understand the strategies our nervous system uses every day. And remote and wireless technology is opening up new questions and opportunities to test these, these questions and hopefully improve education and training in a variety of environments. So thank you. 
Great, thank you very much, Cheryl. So I'm having a look on Slido here, and uh, this is your opportunity to ask questions of Cheryl. So if you type your questions in, I can relay them along. Give them a yeah. <laughs> minute or two to formulate their, their questions. I suspect most of these, most of our participants today are in classrooms. So hopefully the teachers can take the students' questions and put them into the system. Yeah. yeah. This is how we do questions in lecture now too. Is the, type them in the chat and Okay, so how does perception change should someone have a stroke? Ah, yeah, so the, the answer for that very much depends on where the stroke happens. So it, depending on which part of the brain is impacted will change. And so there's some very interesting um, phenomenons that can happen. So for example, you can have a stroke such that you're able to move your limbs and you have no problem with that visual pathway so that I can pick up my cup with no problem. But if I ask you to tell me, is that a cup? I don't have the conscious access to knowing that that is a cup. On the flip side, sometimes if someone has a stroke in a different part of the brain, they can very easily tell you that that is a cup. But when they go to move, they have something that we call ataxia. And so they don't have the ability to make those corrections that you and I don't have to think about. And they have to consciously think about the corrections. And it results in movements being almost, you can see the corrections and they're uh, difficult and slower to perform. So it, it really depends on which part of the, the brain has been um, affected. Okay, great question. Thank you, Cheryl. Is, are there other questions? We've still got a bit of time, so please feel free to. So the the motion capturing camera is, is a, a really accurate version of things like your Xbox Connect. Um, but the, the reason that we, we still use the motion capturing camera is it is accurate to less than uh, up to about a 0 0.1 millimeters, um, which allows us to have really detailed accuracy. And so when researchers are studying things like dental skills and how skilled your dentist is, we want them to be accurate to the very the most detail, detailed ability. So that's why we still like to use our, our motion caption cameras um, to be able to study the real details of, of people's movements. Okay, and one more question. How did you end up in, the, in this profession? And what was your career trajectory? Yeah, so the, is my slide still sharing? Uh, I think it's just the two of us. Okay, that's all good. So the, I, what happened was I, I had the opportunity to do the research in, during my undergraduate degree, and I really found I really enjoyed my days in the lab. They, I liked the variety of being in research. So sometimes you were reading articles, sometimes you were trying to figure out technology. I had to learn how to do basic wiring. Um, one of the first things I had to learn to do was hang a projector from the wall in a specific way. So there was a, a real variety of skills that I really enjoyed. But I also liked the connection between the fundamental research, trying to understand why things work. But then I could really see the application to how we teach uh, physical education, how we teach handwriting, how we uh, coach skills, how it applies to you know physical therapy, for example, after someone has a stroke. And so the I was really just very interested and uh, enjoyed kinesiology. And so while I did my physical therapy degree, I found I was still always asking why. And so I continued to pursue that that research career. Okay, we've got two more questions. Uh, and we've got about two minutes left. Okay. Is this motion capture technology used in filmmaking nowadays? Absolutely, it is. So the Lord of the Rings is one of the, the famous ones. And from a, a scientific standpoint, I like to, to point out that we use the motion caption cameras. And so the best CGI is done where they 
use a wireless version of this and they do up the, the person and then they animate on top of the human movement. So Gollum from Lord of the Rings was done with an actor moving and then they animated over top. And that always still looks the most natural. When we try to animate human movement and to make it look like how humans move, we don't have the ability to do that. It's getting better, but humans, there's still a lot we don't understand and a lot about that, the intricacies of that movement control that is best captured with that motion capture. And so it absolutely is used in film. And our last question, do you work with people with diseases like Parkinson's? The, I don't directly, but many of my colleagues do. Um, so there's a, quite a bit of work looking at using um, proprioceptive cues versus visual cues in order to help somebody with Parkinson's use a different pathway. So one example is the Parkinson's impacts our ability to self-initiate a movement. And so one of the things that can be helpful is to use visual lines or like a railroad or I had um, one patient I'd worked with stuck a flag on the end of his cane. And so you can use those alternate pathways in your brain instead of having to self-initiate the gate, each time he would just step to the flag. And so by using those different pathways provides redundancy and an ability for us to adapt to those different um, situations. So it's definitely a, a field that's studied. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl, for your presentation today and your participation in Set Day 2021. Thank you very much. Hey. Okay, our, our next presenter is doc, Dr. Kyle Bobbywash, and uh, his presentation is entitled Pollinator Ecology and the Building of an Equitable Canadian Science System. Kyle is an assistant professor and an Indigenous scholar in the Department of Entomology in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. His research focuses on understanding the ecology of beneficial insects in agroecosystems and the greater landscape. His goal, is to build, his goal is to better characterize the landscape and resources utilized by insects to understand how land management might affect insect community composition and ecosystem service delivery. Over to you, Kyle. Thanks, Jay. Um, you know, and I like to think that I'm super lucky to uh, be doing this job because, you know, it's ever since I can remember, I've been catching wild animals and rearing and breeding all sorts of uh, exotic pets and, and wild things in my house. So this is like the, the perfect job for me. And, you know, and I think it's important to think about that, you know, humans were so connected to those wild species that are, exist all around us. And I think that's, I'm going to present kind of a, a pretty thorough overview of things that I'm working on right now. I think we can all agree that, you know, bees are really important, um, but just how important is, is something that's, you know, emerging and we know more about every, every year and every, every day almost. If we look at the number of, you know, say just honeybee hives, right, the, the most basic pollinator, we see that the number of honeybee hives over time has not really increased that much, especially if we focus on this black line at the bottom here. This is the global change in honeybee hives over time. If we look at the percentage of agricultural production that depends on pollinators, we see here in the pink line over time that degree of dependency on pollination to produce an agricultural crop has increased. So not only are we seeing a mismatch in the growth of like an agricultural pollinator uh, relative to agricultural production, um, but we know just right now that, you know, bees, honeybees alone are really valuable. They provide billions and billions of dollars of an ecosystem service to an agricultural, uh, you know, to global agricultural production. In Canada alone, honeybee pollination, just the pollination itself is worth at least $2 billion. And we know it's important. Of course, it's important to, to have pollination. Uh, when we have no, uh, no pollination, right, we might not get any crop. But even when we have poor pollination, we might see some really dramatic uh, quality issues, right? With blueberries, cucumbers, or strawberries, we'll have malformed, small, deformed fruit. Uh, with something like canola seed, right, we're going to have smaller canola seeds uh, resulting in um, resulting in just less productivity, less profitability for farmers. And not only you know, does this mismatch happen in agricultural systems, but beekeepers themselves are a little concerned about uh, the effects of agricultural practices on their bee colonies. Right when I was working in British Columbia, one of the major issues that happened one year was that 
beekeepers did not want to bring their uh, their bees into the blueberry fields, right? So already, if you're a blueberry farmer, you can start thinking, oh man, this is going to be a really tough year. So we need to start thinking of pollinators and agricultural systems as a complex, right? Agricultural production is not just for humans, but it also provides all sorts, sorts of resources for those pollinators as well. And something we also don't consider is the fact that in Canada, we're doing pretty, pretty fine, right? I talked about this increase in production that needs pollinators, but you know, it was that the trend over time has stayed relatively stagnant in the developed world. It's in the developing world where the production reliant on pollinators has really increased. We can see this on the right right here. And it's in those areas, those countries where we see the greatest production deficit that's due to likely uh, not having enough pollinators. And it's not just, you know, pure crop numbers, pure poundage of food, but we know that in a lot of developing countries, uh, those communities are reliant upon the nutrients of a lot of those specialty crops, right? They're not just uh, reliant on you know, like the pure caloric intake of producing corn and all these uh, other crops, but it's the, the micronutrients that are really uh, important for those communities. Those are reliant the most uh, on pollinators uh, to actually pollinate those crops. And something right to get away from the honeybee stuff, what we can see globally, this is a, just a, uh, a global graph of how reliant we are on either wild insects for pollination or honeybees. Uh, so in the circles with green, what we see is, you know, crop production that's reliant primarily on honeybees. As we see more pink in some of these circles, that signifies that the crop productions in those areas are reliant on wild pollinators to actually meet a lot of this production uh, need for farmers. And obviously, you know, when we have these pollination deficits or this decrease in crop, uh, in crop dependent plants, we can imagine that it's due to insufficient pollinators, whether it's wild or native pollinators, the, the, the production capacity of an agricultural system is oftentimes very reliant on insects uh, providing ecosystem services like pollinators. So the work I like to do is, you know, just to better understand this uh, pollination ecology, this environment, right? A lot of my work takes place in uh, blueberry fields or specialty uh, crop, uh, specialty fruit crop fields, where I'm looking at ways to improve pollination and try to understand what the variability in yield and production might be. So, you know, every year I have all sorts of students, some more brave than others. Here you can see the braver ones uh, without the bee suits. You know, and sometimes we just look and observe honeybee behavior or pollinator behavior, looking at what type of pollen they're bringing back, looking at the activity that they're uh, uh, that's occurring in the colony. We'll be out in the field pollinating uh, flowers, you know, trying to replicate what bees are doing on the ground. You know, we're often comparing hand pollination or no pollination treatments to treatments where we have that bee po pollination just to see what the value is of, you know, different types of pollination and what uh, what a crop might look like if we didn't have any pollination, just to really be able to ascribe a particular value uh, to that, you know, ecosystem service that a bee uh, provides. And, you know, I like working on interesting crops, no, not the big crops necessarily, because we know a lot of our specialty fruit crops might have particular pollination syndromes or pollination quirks that, you know, result in only particular bees being really effective at doing this. Case in point, something like a bumblebee and a blueberry flower, those, that's a tightly linked evolutionary, uh, evolutionary uh, relationship. Uh, a, you know, a blueberry flower only really releases a bunch of pollen when it's vibrated at a particular frequency. So this is something that honeybees can do, but something that, you know, some wild bees can do, something that bumblebees do, right? They buzz and something that a toothbrush can do, right? So we already know that, you know, there might be different behaviors. There might be different functional diversity, not just species diversity, that will increase the capacity for something to, uh, to, to be accomplished really effectively. And we know it's not just buzzing or bees have all sorts of interesting behaviors, right? We might have a small bee that's able to pollinate more flowers within a minute than a really fat large bee that takes a little bit more time to get around. We have bees that might have hairs more attuned to, uh, you know, sticking pollen onto themselves. So we might have bees that are depositing or releasing pollen onto a flower more so than another type of bee. 
And when we look in particular system, this is really clear, right? We have a leafcutter bee, these mega Kylie workers that tend not to visit as many flowers per minute as honeybees or bumblebees, bombus workers. Uh, again, if we're looking at pollen grains deposited on a flower, we see that honeybees in this scenario are the worst, with um, leafcutter bees and bumblebees being able to drop a lot more pollen onto these flowers, thereby increasing uh, the amount of pollen that the, the plant is uh, receiving, improving production capacity. Um, so pollinators are important. It's important to think of that agricultural perspective, but it's also important to think about what do bees need? Even in an agricultural field, there's a lot more than just that agricultural crops for uh, floral resources, right? There's a lot more than just blueberry pollen and nectar in any blueberry field or in any agricultural field. And yes, we, we can look at what bees are using by, you know, looking at these uh, pollen grains under the microscope. Here on the left, we see our blueberry pollen uh, with these four cool tetrads. On the right, we see rosaceae. It might be, pollen, or it might be um, apple pollen or something like rose pollen. Uh, we can see that in their microscope, but we can also see it on bees, right? If we just look at bees sometimes, you can see that they're often uh, bringing alongside them very different colors of pollen. And oftentimes these pollen or these colors of pollen reflect a particular forage source, right? So we might have a really bright pollen in yellow. Um, we have a really bright pollen in yellow and a really dark one in orange, for example. And but we're do, using all these techniques, what we're able to do is we're able to decide uh, or we're able to determine what bees are using in the environment. So even in a entirely in, in fields that are entirely blueberry, we have a bumblebee on the left that might be using rose or apple pollen. We have a honeybee in the middle here that's using buttercup pollen. Right. We have bumblebees that are that might be using blueberry pollen. One minute, Kyle. OK. And it's, it's, all the, it's all these factors that are really important for us to understand. We know that farms are very differential landscapes with all sorts of habitat diversity. And, and this is becoming more increasingly more important as we start to understand how bees are utilizing the environment. We know that you know, more diverse environments might, be, uh, might, might help our agricultural production capacity. And we need to know this in more areas than just farms. It's important that we start looking at indigenous communities as places where we can start to conduct some of this research so that we start to create these ideas of food security and you know, healthy ecosystems that result in happier bees, happier nutritional environments, and happier people. And I like to think, you know, this is curing that colonial hangover where we're able to uh, increase the management of our lands and bring more voices in to really start to build not only a science system, but an ecosystem that has more voices helping decide what happens in it. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Kyle. Uh, so we'll, uh, we've put up the Slido for questions. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, kick it off while we're waiting for Someone had a question. So we see a lot of stories uh, in the news lately about bee populations and declining bee populations. Can you uh, kind of comment on how this sort of feeds into this whole sort of pollination side of it? 100%, right? And I think something we know a lot about are honeybees, right? You can count honeybees. Every beekeeper is counting their honeybees so they can, you know, calculate how much they've lost over the season or over the winter. Um, but something, especially in my last slides, I wanted to focus on a little bit was the fact that we have very little idea about wild bee populations. We're not doing enough research. First of all, it's really hard to count wild bees, but we're not doing enough research for those hundreds and hundreds of wild species to be able to track their populations effectively. We can imagine a lot of the uh, risks faced by honeybees are also being faced by these wild bees. Um, so it's just something that I think is we really need to put a lot more focus on. Okay, great. So we have some questions now from, from the students out there. Are there any insects that are beneficial to agriculture besides pollinators? A hundred percent, and especially being in Manitoba, you know, pollinators are not that important. I, I'll say this somewhat jokingly, but they're not as important as something like maybe a pest predator, right? We have a lot of agricultural crops here in Manitoba that are not actually reliant on pollinators for production. Right? Not every plant needs uh, pollinator-mediated pollination. Corn, for example, right? that pollinates just through the wind. There's a lot of wind-pollinated crops. But we have all sorts of beneficial insects, uh, parasitoids, 
uh, beetle predators, all these things that are reducing uh, pest pressures on crops that, uh, you know, farmers benefit from. Um, you know, in some scenarios, if you have enough predators, you might be able to reduce your pesticide applications or, or something like that. So, so there's all sorts of cool ecological functions that work inside this really complex food web that might benefit agricultural production. Okay, great. Is it possible for the environment to survive without pollinators? 100% not, right? So, so when we talk about agricultural crops, right, some, some might... Uh, do well, right? A good production, a good proportion of our things like wheat that don't rely on um, something like pollinators. But I th about 87% of all flower species benefit to some extent from animal mediated pollination. You know, so there's bats, there's beetles that pollinate, but you know, insects play the major, insects and bees play the major role in pollination. So if we have 87% of uh, flowers of plants that don't have uh, pollination to actually allow themselves to reproduce, we're going to see this huge cascade of effects. Not only will flowers decline, but all the animals and the ecosystems that rely on all these different plants will also start to decline, right? So th this is really early on in the food web. And you know, as soon as you start to affect such a uh, early part of the system, right, we're going to have all these downstream effects that will really affect biodiversity. Okay, uh, here's another one. Could we use human methods of pollination in conjunction with natural pollinators, such as nanotechnology, or would that lead to adverse effects due to competition? Uh, that's it. That's a really interesting question. So, so we do use human human effects right now, and I often like to put some of these slides up in some places like uh, Japan and China, in in the plum and pear and and fruit specialty fruit growing areas. They actually have people that go in there now to pollinate a lot of these uh, specialty fruit crops, right? They have people with special brooms or special paintbrushes that are out there and actually hand pollinating because they don't have enough uh, pollinators in some of these uh, around some of these farm systems to actually allow that to happen. Uh, when we think of utilizing, you know, nanotechnology or, or robots or even molecular methods to remove uh, the need for, say, outcrossing, the, the pollination between two different types of plants, there, there, might be some, uh, there might be some work there, but in my mind, it's so much easier. It's so much more ethical. It's so much more moral to think about. Instead of thinking of new ways, why don't we just preserve these classic ways that have been with us for you know, millennia, for millions of years? Why don't we just maintain this ecological relationship rather than trying to find a way to uh, you know, to cover up our mismanagement of the environment. Okay, and let me put two questions together here. So what can we do as individuals about the bee shortage? And what do you think of rooftop bee farming? So what can, what can we do? And, and I think this is a, a big question. And I often like to get back to the root cause of this and maybe get a little political is, a lot of these decisions on how we utilize the environment, how it's managed, how conservation areas are made, are made from political decisions, right? As much as we like to think that, you know, society is based on evidence, there's a lot of political opinions that go into everything, how we should manage and how we should utilize our landscapes. So something that I always prioritize is conservation of landscapes at that large scale. Make sure that our government officials are really cognizant of the need to maintain biodiversity. At a smaller scale, you know, do as much as you can to really make sure that you're increasing biodiversity in your yard, on your farm, right? Volunteer for, um, you know, just planting more flowers or more vegetation along your street. Doing these small things, you know, they, they have an impact locally, but we need to make sure that we're planning our development as a society around the needs for pollinators. And I can't remember what the second part of the question was. Uh, rooftop farming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's focused on honeybees for, for the most part, right? And honeybees are like the 1% of bees that are actually managed, right? But honeybees are not native to North America, but we're, you know, it's a nice hobby. So 100%, I think it's a great hobby to have. But increasing honeybees should not be the focus of a conservation strategy for pollination. Honeybees are really fun. They're really neat, but they're the agricultural, they're the cows in the environment, right? If we're thinking about preserving moose and deer, we're not thinking about, oh, how do we make sure this cow is happy on the landscape, right? It's a really cool way to actually get in tune with our food systems and understand the importance of pollination, but they're not the most important uh, in terms of conservation tools or conservation education. 
Okay, great. Well, that's the uh, the end of uh, our time with you, Kyle. Thank you very much for participating in Set Day 2021. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. <laughs> okay, our third presenter before we take a short break is Kirsten Brink. Her presentation is entitled How Do Paleontologists Determine What Extinct Animals Ate? Kirsten joined the University of Manitoba just over a year ago as an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences in the Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of the Environment, Earth, and Resources. She is a vertebrate paleontologist interested in the evolution and development of teeth and bones, specifically tissue structure and growth rates and the relationship between structure, growth, and animal ecology. Her research involves the use of living animal models to understand how extinct animals grew and interacted with their environment. She uses histology, uh, microscopy, computed tomography, otherwise known as CT scans, scanning electron microscope, and transmission electron micro microscopy to address her research questions. Over to you, Kirsten. Great, thank you very much. Just make sure I'm unmuted. Okay, so I, I changed the title of the presentation a little bit. We're gonna focus mostly just on dinosaurs today. Um, so I am a vertebrate paleontologist. So I uh, started with uh, uh, an undergraduate degree in earth sciences and biological sciences. Um, and throughout my undergraduate degree, I was lucky enough to work at different museums where I got to go out in the field and actually collect uh, dinosaur bones and marine reptile bones and do some preparation in the lab. Um, and then after doing a master's degree and a PhD, I actually, a lot of my work now is focused on uh, in the lab and looking at specimens in museums and doing research on them in the lab indoors. And uh, uh, the thing that I think is super, super interesting about dinosaurs is their teeth. And hopefully I can convince you as well why teeth are super cool. Um, first of all, they're really, really diverse. So each of these teeth, the photos of teeth I have on the screen are from different species of dinosaur and they all, there's some similarities between them, but they all have unique features. And these features can all be used to figure out what a dinosaur ate. So I've grouped them all together here and put little icons so showing that some of the more leafier teeth are, are plant eaters, some of the pointier teeth are meat eaters or fish eaters. And then we have other ones that have these um, different bumps and grooves along the edges that suggest they were eating fruit or that they were eating insects. Um, and the, the, you know, an understanding of what these extinct animals ate is really important to interpret these past ecosystems. Um, how did all these dinosaurs live together? Uh, were they eating different things and sharing resources? Uh, and that is contributing to why they were so successful in the past, or does it help understand why they all went extinct? Um, and understanding these past ecosystems, I think is super important for understanding why the planet is the way it is today and where the future of the planet might be going, if we can understand how life has existed on the planet throughout time. And we can get all of this information from just by looking at teeth. So I had grouped these all into different sorts of types of diet, but how do we actually know what these animals were eating? They're all extinct. We can't go out outside, you know, I, although I wish we could, go out and, and look at a dinosaur eating and, and try to figure out you know, how did it fit into a particular ecosystem. So how do we actually do that? So this is a lot of what my research is focused on. Um, I look at this, that tooth development. So how does a tooth grow? How does the shape of a tooth form? And then I look at macro and micro structures in teeth. So the macro refers to the overall shape of a tooth and the microstructure is what is that tooth made of? So if you were to cut a tooth open and look at it with a really powerful microscope, what do the different tissues inside that tooth say about uh, what that animal might have been eating? <clears throat> and um, like I said before, because we can't go outside and, and see what a dinosaur was eating, we have to look at uh, living animals. So we can try to find similarities between the teeth that we find in the fossil record 
and compare them to teeth from living animals. So I have a, a couple of examples here. There's a horse that have these really long, tall teeth. Um, there's iguana at the bottom that has small pointy teeth. There's a Komodo dragon in the top middle and a crocodile at the bottom that have uh, longer pointier teeth. And then that thing in the top right is actually a fish that has like a full a mouth completely covered with these flat crushing teeth. And the bottom right is a bat that has teeth that are uh, well adapted for eating fruit. So they have crushing teeth at the back and pointy teeth at the front. So we can use all these examples from living animals to interpret what these extinct animals might have been eating. Now, a really cool thing about dinosaurs is that they had lifelong tooth replacement, which means that they would um, hatch out of an egg with a bunch of teeth in the mouth, and then constantly throughout their life, they would be shedding those teeth and growing new teeth. And we know this because if you look at a broken uh, jawbone, or if you do a CT scan or an x-ray of these bones, um, you can actually see these little baby teeth that are hiding underneath the gums that are waiting and ready to erupt when those big teeth fall out. And this isn't just a characteristic of dinosaurs. It's actually a characteristic of all kinds of different animals that are alive today. So crocodiles do this, frogs do this, snakes and other reptiles do it, like iguanas. Um, modern day turtles don't have any teeth, but this little funny little guy right in the middle of your screen um, is an ancient ancestor of turtles and they actually do have teeth. So throughout the evolutionary history of a turtle, they lost their teeth. Uh, at the top, there's a leopard gecko, which I have done a lot of work on looking at how teeth develop, but they have lifelong tooth replacement. Fish do, sharks do. I think sharks are actually a pretty good example because you can actually see the next generation of teeth when you look inside a shark's mouth, if you ever get the chance to do that. And then this kind of um, uh, feathery guy up in the top right corner is a, a bird. So the ancestors of birds are actually very closely related to dinosaurs and they all had teeth, although modern birds have beaks. Um, so all of these animals were able to continuously replace their teeth throughout life. Um, and by studying the tissues in living animals, we can actually understand how they're able to do this. So we have a little diagram right here. This part is would be inside the mouth and this part would be underneath the gums. And we have these soft tissues that form a little bud and that little bud will form the shape of the tooth. And then once this tooth gets to a certain size, another little bud forms. So this tissue is responsible for initiating that next generation of teeth. And then once the shape of the tooth is formed, uh, these hard tissues will be deposited. That's the dentine and the enamel that, that your teeth are made of. And then it'll erupt into the mouth and then that process continues and continues on. So we can study this in the living reptiles to understand how this was happening in uh, the extinct animals. And why, you know, what's the benefit of having lifelong tooth replacement? Well, you can add new teeth to the back of your jaw as those jaws grow through time, they can add new teeth to the back. But also every time a tooth is shed and a new one uh, erupts, that tooth can be a little bit bigger. So the teeth can actually you know, stay proportionate to the size of the jaw. Um, the teeth can change size and shape throughout growth. So this is an example of a tegu. When tegus hatch, they have these sharp pointy teeth and they eat mostly insects. But adult tegus have these crushing teeth and they can eat um, snails and clams and lots of plants as well. Um, having lifelong tooth replacement also means you can build specialized dentitions. And I'll show you another picture of this. This is a, a duckbill dinosaur. And each of these little, little pillars are actually a tooth. So if we look at a photo of a duckbill dinosaur, here's the eye, here's the nose. This is a grinding surface of teeth. So all of those little teeth, they form this pillar like a, that is just constantly erupting into the mouth and it rubs up against the upper jaw to create a grinding surface. Um, and this grinding surface would be used to mash up plant material. And this is very similar to what we see in horses. This is a picture of a jaw from a baby horse. Here's a, um, an adult tooth and here is the baby tooth. Um, and you can kind of see they're forming that stack of teeth just like we see in the duckbill dinosaurs. And horses eat a lot of plants. So we can see a similarity here. We have a really long tooth that um, gets worn away throughout life. 
So we can compare, okay, duckbill dinosaurs have the same kind of teeth. So they were probably eating plants just like a horse does. And then the last example we'll look at is from the meat eating dinosaurs. <clears throat> so having um, the ability to continuously replace your teeth means if one falls out or if one breaks off, a new one is ready and waiting and will just erupt so that the that animal will always be able to take really good bites of its food and will always be able to eat. And if we look closely at a T-Rex tooth, they have these tiny little bumps along the front and back of the teeth. And we can compare this to animals that are alive today that have the same type of tooth, which is, and this example is a Komodo dragon. And these are really strong hunters. They'll uh, rip into their, they'll bite into their prey and they'll take big chunks out of it. So by doing a comparison, we know that Komodo dragons and the theropod dinosaurs. One minute. Thank you. Uh, were meat-eating animals. Now, what I was really interested in, um, if you go back to looking at these bumps, um, one study that I did during my PhD was to cut open these teeth and then grind the tooth down so it was really, really thin and look at it with a microscope. And I found this strange little structure in the tooth right here. It's like a, a circle um, inside the tooth. And I cut open a tooth from a Komodo dragon that's shown right here. And then, so this is a boundary, this black and white boundary between the inside of the tooth and the outside of the tooth, these two different tissue layers. And that's the same boundary right here. And the Komodo dragon does not have that funny little circle in between those bumps on its teeth, but the dinosaur does have it. So this suggests to me that there's these a special adaptation inside a Tyrannosaurus rex tooth that um, really helps to strengthen it. And it was probably um, help to strengthen the tooth to rip and bite off chunks of meat um, and, this, and actually be able to bite through bone, which is something that the Komodo dragon can't do. So just by having these tiny little adaptations inside the teeth, we can figure out different ways that a dinosaur actually might have been a better or a more ferocious uh, predator than a Komodo dragon that's alive today. So by just looking at the teeth, we're able to piece together all these little bits of information to reconstruct what these past ecosystems look like. And thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Cheryl. So I'll uh, wait for the first question to pop up in Slido. And uh, while we're waiting, uh, my f I'll uh, ask a quick question. So do the, uh, do the teeth continually replace themselves, uh, whether there's damage to the tooth or not, or does the replacement only happen when the teeth itself begins to deteriorate for some reason, it gets broken or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. That's actually uh, a lot of work that I did during my postdoc at the University of British Columbia was looking at that. And the teeth will replace no matter what. So there's almost like a schedule um, where they're, the, tooth, the teeth are like a conveyor belt. They're constantly developing, constantly ready to go. So whether or not that tooth that is in the mouth is still working properly or is damaged doesn't really matter. It's going to fall out at some point and be replaced. Okay, great. And we have our first question. What qualifies something to be called a dinosaur? Oh, that's a deep question. So there are a couple of, of, uh, of important characters that paleontologists look for when they're de uh, defining the group of dinosaurs. Um, so there's very specific shapes of the bones in terms of the hips and in the skull. Um, pretty much, well, every dinosaur lived on land. There's an exception of Spinosaurus, which is recently debated to be a swimmer. But if you think of any animal that is swimming, like the marine reptiles, those are actually a separate group from dinosaurs. Or the ones that fly, like the pterosaurs, those are a separate group from the dinosaurs. And it's all based on the bones in the skull and bones in the hips. Okay. Well, we don't seem to have any other questions coming in at the moment. We'll give it a few more seconds here to see if there are other questions. Oh, and there we go. Would it be possible for a human to replace some teeth like a dinosaur? That's also a really great question. Um, and I think that is the goal is to one day, if, if one of your teeth is becomes damaged or you get too many cavities in your tooth, it would be uh, really great to be able to grow a new tooth and to replace it, right? Um, the problem is that our teeth are have really complicated shapes in them. 
and our teeth are, are, they fit together really well so that we can chew properly. So it's really hard to grow a new tooth that um, matches, like I'm thinking growing a tooth in the lab that you could put into your mouth, which is what some researchers are working on. But it's really hard to get the exact correct shape of that tooth in order to replace it. And then there's another idea where, like I had shown, there's a diagram, there's a special little bundle of cells that's responsible for growing a new tooth in a reptile. So if we can figure out how to trigger that group of cells in a mammal or in a human like us so that we could just grow our own new tooth in our mouth, that's also some research labs are trying to work on that as well. They're looking for specific cells called stem cells that might be able to actually grow a new tooth within our own bodies. Okay, thank you. Other than teeth, are there other factors that determine what extinct animals ate? Mm, yes, there's lots of things. So the shape of the skull is really important. Uh, how strong was it? And that's there's a lot of paleontologists that do 3D modeling. Um, so they'll take a scan of a skull and they'll reconstruct the muscles around the bones to figure out how strong the skull was. And that could determine what the animal was eating. Um, with these duckbill dinosaurs that have the big columns of teeth, they were probably actually chewing their food and their, their bones were their kinetic. So there was lots of movement happening in the jaws. So that is a, another clue for um, how much they could eat in a day. Um, and then there's also other clues like um, some dinosaurs would keep rocks in their stomach called gastroliths and birds will do this today as well. And then having these rocks in their stomachs will actually help them digest food as well. So that's another clue that we can look at to see what they were eating. Okay, and we've got a bunch of questions now related to uh, uh, the, uh, I guess I'll call it the thrill of sort of being in the field. Okay. So what, what, what types of dinosaur teeth fossils have been found in Manitoba? Oh, there are actually no dinosaurs known for Manitoba. Uh, we do have marine reptiles, though. So the world's largest mosasaur, which is a marine reptile, is on display at the Canadian Fossil Discovery Center in Morden. And they have a lot of really good marine reptile. And they have birds and turtles, um, lots of fossils that... Because um, in the Cretaceous in Manitoba, it was uh, the whole province was underneath a seaway called the Western Interior Seaway. So... All of the rocks that are, that have fossils in them from Manitoba, uh, they're all they all preserve animals that lived underwater. So we don't have any dinosaur fossils in Manitoba yet. I'm hoping someday we'll find something. Um, so, but no no dinosaurs here. Okay, and so we have some students cool about are uh, uh, wondering about the coolest place you've gone digging, and have you ever actually found a dinosaur bone at a dig, and what kind of a dinosaur was it? Oh. So I think I've done a lot of work in Alberta in Dinosaur Provincial Park and that um, they have, I th it's one of the top three, I would say, best places in the world to go look for dinosaur bones. That's pretty, I mean, you just walk and there's just bones all over the place. It's hard to like not, not even like just avoid stepping on them. There's so many bones there. Um, so I found um, uh, jaw bones from Albertosaurus and another jaw from a duckbill dinosaur, a lower jaw that we got to collect. And then I've worked on other um, larger specimens, like uh, entire skulls from duckbill dinosaurs and the horned dinosaurs called Centrosaurus in Alberta. And I also got to collect a marine reptile called an Elasmosaurus. They have these really, really, really long necks and they were swimmers. Um, and that was in Lethbridge, so in Southern Alberta. All right. Wow. I'm sure there's lots of envy uh, in classrooms right now for uh, that experience. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Here's our last question. From the dinosaurs to Komodo dragons, we lost an adaptation, the circle structure. Do we know of any animals that are developing the same adaptation? And if so, what conditions are leading to this? Mm, yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, and it's, ooh, it's, that's a tricky one to answer. So from all of the teeth that I have examined, so I've looked at shark teeth because they have those bumpy edges as well. Um, I've looked at some other extinct groups and I haven't seen it in any other group except for one, which is actually in the lineage leading to mammals. So animals that are more closely related to us than they are to any dinosaur or to any Komodo dragon. 
So there's one other animal that I've seen this strange round structure. And they had these really big kind of canine. They almost look like a saber-toothed cat, but they're not related to cats. They're older, way, way, way older than cats. So only two animals that I've looked at have this strange structure. So I think it's a special adaptation for biting and actually ripping off chunks of a prey um, and probably would help to actually, you know, rip through pieces of bone and to get those big chunks of meat off of whatever they were trying to eat. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Kirsten, for joining us on Set Day 2021. And uh, thanks to Kyle and Cheryl as well. Our next uh, set presenter is Dr. Deanna Santer. Her presentation is entitled, Understanding How Immune System Fights Against Viruses, What We've Learned in Our Fight Against COVID-19. Deanna recently joined the University of Manitoba as an assistant professor in the Department of Immunology at the Max Rady College of Medicine. She holds the GS Care Research Chair in Immunology of Infectious Diseases. Deanna completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Alberta and her PhD in Immunology at the University of Washington. Her thesis focused on investigating how type I interferons contribute to pathology in the autoimmune disease systematic lupus erythematosus. For her postdoctoral work, she came back to Canada to work in Nobel laureate Dr. Michael Houghton's lab at the University of Alberta, where her projects included working with various viruses before developing her own research program studying the newest family of interferons, interferon lambdas. Outside of doing experiments and analyzing the data, Deanna is actively involved in promoting women in STEM. Over to you, Deanna. All right, let's see here. All right, I can't see anybody, but hopefully this is working. <laughs> Um, so thank you for having me. I'm, I wish we could have all met in person, but uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about my career thus far, wanting to understand how our immune system fights against viruses. So I thought I'd just start with one slide, uh, thinking about back to when I was in high school, and I was really thinking about how I got to where I am now. So I didn't have any, you know, scientific researchers in my immediate family. It's not like I knew what getting a PhD was or how to become a researcher. But what I did know is I really loved biology. Chemistry was kind of like, yeah, you know, it's okay. And I really didn't like physics. And so what I knew going into my undergraduate degree was I was gonna start in biology and it's okay if you don't know where you're gonna go. But what I discovered was that there are many different options as soon as you go to university. And so just a quick overview, because again, I was, I was so clueless when I started is that you could start off with a Bachelor of Science degree. So I actually was able to go to the University of Alberta, even though I grew up in Saskatoon. And there was a new program that they had started called the Immunology Infection Program. And that really intrigued me because thinking about how bacteria, viruses, even worms can get into our body and how our immune system can actually fight against them. But it really wasn't until I spent two summers at uh, National Research Council in Saskatoon or Ottawa, where I was actually in the lab, really discovered my passion for doing research, especially involving human uh, disease and, and immunology. And then I was fortunate to go to Seattle, as was mentioned, to do my PhD. And that was where I was really um, immersed into the lab and taking classes. And then came coming back to the University of Alberta, um, so we call this like the postdoctoral phase. So this is really where you're a researcher developing your own research program. And that was really where I got interested in viruses. And so I was able to work in, with patient samples from hepatitis C virus patients, as well as looking at how vaccines are regulated and how our, how our bodies respond to vaccines. And then as was mentioned, I had never been to Manitoba before. And so last summer I came here and, and got to see Winnipeg for the first time. And in November, I uh, actually started my own lab here. And so my lab will focus on these kind of antiviral or immune responses and how we can actually fight against viruses, as I said. And so when I was thinking back to, you know, why did I choose immunology and just thinking I made this little uh, word, word cloud here. And it really is the fact that immunology works and is, is the knowledge is used in so many different areas. And so you think about, you know, when you have an allergic reaction, that's your immune system. We actually are using our knowledge of immunology to fight against cancer. 
So you actually can make treatments for cancer now based on those, our, for example, our T cells. And so there's just so many ways that, you know, you can study immunology and apply that to so many different areas. And that's really what intrigued me. And then viruses, which is kind of this really cool area to think about how they evolve to fight against us and how we evolved to fight against them. And so we actually think about our immune system, obviously I don't have time in only 10 minutes, but we have a lot of different cell types that all have their own specialized task. And so in my lab, we're looking, especially in COVID-19 at those B and T cells. And these are the cells that actually can develop memory and help you to respond against the virus or after a vaccine, or if you just see the virus again in many different cases. And so you actually think about uh, when you're first infected with a virus, we actually know a lot overall of what's happening, but it's really those little details, especially when we discovered this new virus, SARS-CoV-2, where we had to really understand what was happening. And so you can see here in red, the virus, and what the really, the first, what we call the innate immune, uh, the innate immune response, we have these IFNs or interferons, and that's what I'm especially interested in. So within hours, we have this response to a virus that'll help you actually directly inhibit the virus and prevent it from spreading to more cells. But when we say about vaccines, why you're not protected right away is because your T cells and your B cells that make antibodies are not actually fully responding until well, after seven days. We need to actually ramp up the response um, when you're first encountering a virus for the first time. As I like this cartoon, you think about these B cells that are actually um, shooting or, or making antibodies. And these are these antibodies that actually, these little Y-shaped things actually bind to the outside of any virus, whether it's after a flu shot or flu or or SARS-CoV-2 infection, that you actually can now neutralize or block the virus from actually entering your cells. So that's why we say you have these neutralizing antibodies, because it actually binds to the outside of a virus and prevents it from infecting. So that's really what we want to be able to induce when we have a vaccine. And of course, I don't need to introduce COVID-19 after this past crazy year, but it was really interesting to see how detailed we can actually now see viruses. We know we can't see them by our naked eye, but we have special microscopes and this is actually done in a lab where you can take um, human lung cells, for example, and these are cilia actually at the top of the cell. And when you zoom in, each of these little circles shown on the right are actually a virus particle. And so you can imagine in the lab with many different labs around the world wanting to understand how the virus is getting in. What can we do to you know, inhibit the virus directly or block the virus from replicating? And that's why there's so many different clinical trials ongoing to be able to develop new drugs. And so one of the aspects of COVID-19 that my lab is studying is understanding um, how the vaccine response will be regulated. So although I'm not developing vaccines, we can actually use the knowledge and get samples um, with blood from different people who've received a vaccine and think about what has happened to our immune cells. And so it's really obvious uh, in this was from the Pfizer vaccine data. So if you did not receive a vaccine, the incidence of COVID-19 sharply increases and so that tells us that the patients are not protected and they're developing COVID-19. This, this was just amazing. Like we just discovered this virus a year, within less than a year, we had very safe vaccines that have been tested in over 40,000 people. And if you do receive two doses of this, this specific vaccine, where there's multiple ones now, you had up to 95% you know, protection, which is just amazing. And that's why it really has been a worldwide effort. But we actually think really closely about the immunology behind it all. This is showing antibody response. This is what we learn about in our first year immunology class. Is that when you first get exposed to a virus or other pathogen, you have a specific immune response, which is not, you know, the best of the best response. So you have it come up, but then it goes down. And so it's normal for our immune response to go back down because you don't want to have an overactive immune response going on for many weeks. And so we have this, you see, it's not back to baseline. So we have now this pool of cells that we have that we call memory cells. And these guys are going to remember what they've been exposed to. And so if you have a second vaccine or you see a virus, you now have an even heightened response. And so this is really key to get this long lived memory so that you're protected for many, many years even. So there's some vaccines that only protect you for one year, for example, like the flu shot vaccine we get you know, every year, but there's some vaccines that you get once in your life and you never have to again. But the real kind of uh, detailed mechanisms I do in my lab are actually studying these interferons so they were discovered many years ago to inhibit viruses. And so you can think about it as a virus gets into a cell, it makes copies of itself, and then it'll go out and infect other cells. 
But we've developed these proteins that actually signal and bind to cells to directly induce these different other antiviral proteins that will now inhibit the virus. And so we actually have different types of interferons, some more dis that were discovered more recently that I work on called the type 3 interferons. But unfortunately, even then, after all these years, the viruses have made their own proteins to block these signals. So we have to kind of think of the viruses, you know, they're actually smart, they're little ninjas that actually make proteins that can, you know, block what we need to do to try to, you know, so they're just having their own inhibitor proteins. And unfortunately, as well, in COVID-19, there's patients that are not making enough of these interferons, or we've developed ways of not signaling as well through them, or even the virus itself, as I said, could be blocking. And so a really um, kind of smart way what we're doing in, in various clinical trials is using these interferons, injecting them, you know, one, one time into a patient to induce our natural response. And so you can imagine if you didn't have enough of a good response, we can now could promote clearance of the virus. And this is exactly what we found is our collaboration with Toronto. And so Dr. Jordan Feld there led this clinical trial, which was published just this month, shown in blue here. You have the amount of patients that clear the virus or they're negative, you want to have a high proportion of people, right? So if you have that one injection versus placebo where you're not getting any treatment, you have much more people that are, protect, uh, that are actually clearing the virus and it actually happened at a faster rate. So of course, I can't show you all the data, but it's just super exciting that we now have, we now have a drug that could actually uh, be treating COVID-19 patients and now we're expanding that into more people to really make sure this and as well as other interferons could be used even in other viruses in the future. And so with that, I'm totally open to ask, uh, answering any questions about immunology, you know, COVID-19 to the best of my ability, and I'm just very happy to be here. So hopefully you guys learned something and think immunology is cool. <laughs> wow, okay. So uh, uh, with 23 seconds to spare, uh, you, uh, uh, you pulled pulled that one off in under 10, so thank you for that. Good job. Uh, so I noticed on one of your slides, it was the one that uh, I think they were uh, uh, from an electron microscope. I don't know whether it was tunneling scanning or what it is. And you had a little uh, scale over on the lower right-hand corner. It showed the virus somewhere around about 50 nanometers, I think. That'd be... So, so how big are these little tentacles that we that we sort of hear about that seem to be the part that end up attaching? Yeah, so the tentacles like in that in that picture, like that's like the cilia that are on the airway cells. But yeah, like the the virus itself obviously is so small, and so that's why yeah, it's, it's a scanning electron microscope that actually is used. And then there's other types of microscopes that are used. You can actually see even the spikes of the um, protein on the virus. So yeah, we definitely need these specialized techniques uh, or else we actually just measure the virus in the lab looking at its you know, genomic content. So we could actually measure RNA. And then another way we actually tell if someone's infected is we see if they have antibodies. And so that's kind of, you know, if you hear about it in the news, you're going to hear, oh, this person was PCR positive. So meaning that they had detection of the virus because we can't, you know, use a fancy microscope on each person. We need these rapid tests. So. Okay, so some questions coming in. What makes COVID more dangerous than the flu? Ah, yes, that is the very, very well studied. We're, we're still learning. Um, what is kind of most scary to me, I guess, is the fact we're getting a lot of long-term effects. So even though it seems like people are clearing the virus, we're getting um, people with heart problems and, and like their lungs are still affected even months later. And this is really what we're trying to understand is <clears throat> you know, how do we predict who's going to develop these severe, like the severe disease? And so there's definitely like millions of dollars being poured in to characterize, you know, who's developing severe versus mild disease. Um, but it really still is not completely understood because the original SARS virus, like, you know, was many years ago now, we didn't have this widespread. So and we have these new variants coming out as well, which seem to have either a longer course of infection or could be even more transmissible. So yeah, it's definitely still not fully understood yet. Okay, thanks. What are reasons why people aren't producing interferons? Ah, yes, this is very recent in the last couple of months. There's been, um, there's actually people who have mutations in what we call these pattern recognition receptors. So like if the virus gets in, its RNA will bind to something and induce interferons. And so you can actually have mutations so those receptors don't work. But there's also even very big, like even more recently, people have 
antibodies to their own interferon receptor or interferons. So you're actually seeing your body accidentally blocking your interferons. And so like we're seeing it only a subset of patients that are not able to make enough. But even if you were making them, we think that this would be a good strategy to still boost what you're making and, and try to get people as within those first few days of being diagnosed, because we're seeing this really quick you know, clearance of the virus, be less quarantine and less infective time. So yeah, so definitely being, definitely uh, we need to understand more, but yeah, more data is coming out every month. Okay, great. What's the most interesting virus you've studied and why? Ah, well, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 obviously is uh, very, very interesting because it's brand new, but I've actually also been really interested in the influenza virus, um, just thinking about how, you know, why, you know, how it has like recombination and how we can have all these different mutants. And like when H1N1 came out, we call it, you know, swine flu or all these different, you know, mutations. So to me, it's, you know, these interferons I work on inhibit all these different viruses. So really, I, I kind of want to keep my options open and study as many viruses as I can. <laughs> what makes the new variants more infectious than, than the, the previous strain? What, what, what is it about them physically that enables them to become more infectious? Yeah, so that's not uh, understood yet, but a paper just came out, I believe, this week even, that now the new hypothesis may be that the people who are infected with, well, at least one of the variants anyways, is actually infectious longer. So like, for example, if you think someone's only infectious for five days, if you got the specific variant, you could be infectious now for eight to 10 days. So that's actually the newest idea. So there was the idea that maybe it's more transmissible or maybe a higher, the virus is replicating more and like making more virus, but now we actually don't know which, which is the right answer. It could be a combination. Okay, great. And this is a STEM question. Do you have a science role model? Ooh, a science role model. Um, I mean, I think as since joining Twitter, I've been amazed uh, just to see how science, science communication really has played a role. And so I'd say one of the main uh, scientists I look up to for both women in science as well as science communication would be Dr. Awasaki at Yale. She has just really done well to promote women in science as well as done some amazing work in the lab for the past over 20 years, so. Okay, great. If this interferon treatment was used at a higher frequency, such as for other viruses, would you predict a rise in autoimmune diseases? So that was, that is very, whoever asked that is very smart. So when I used to work, <laughs> whatever, whatever I used to work, so there's different types of interferons. So the type one interferon I used to work on was actually causing disease in lupus, which is that autoimmune disease. But these type three interferons I now work on do not have that inflammatory effect and not as many side effects. So we're seeing that this treatment is very safe. And, and that is actually even an immunology conference. A lot of people are like, what? They're not the same. And so this is actually a common thing where you think it could cause you know, autoimmunity or cause, cause side effects. And a lot of patients didn't enroll in the trial because they had heard about interferon and were scared about it. So it's actually a different type of interferon. And as well, it's only one dose. So you can imagine just getting one dose. Let's say you're diagnosed on Sunday, you get your dose on Tuesday, and that's it. So you're not going to have, you know, repeated injections for many weeks or anything like that. Okay, thanks. And the last question, are the vaccines still effective on the new variants? Ah, yes. That's another. <laughs> I knew this would go. The uh, the data is still coming in, and I mean, even I can't keep up with all the different uh, papers that are coming out literally every day. So I would say that it depends on the variant, um, but there is a lot of reason if you understand like the basics of immunology that we have these memory cells. We could we can adapt our our responses, and so I I do think that you know we should have a good chance of beating the variants with the vaccine. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us, uh, Deanna, and uh, for participating. Oh, no, it was, it was a very Set good question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Super. Our next, our next speaker is Miss Ella Morris, and her presentation is entitled "Experimental Investigation of Mixing Characteristics of Multiple Elliptic Jets." Ella is a doctoral student at the University of Manitoba, working under the supervision of Dr. Mark Torsche in mechanical engineering. She completed both her BSc in engineering and MSc at the University of Manitoba. 
Ella is the recipient of an NSERC uh, Alexander Graham Bell graduate, uh, Canadian Graduate Scholarship uh, at the doctoral level, and a master's award recipient for Indigenous students. She is currently working on research in the area of fluid mechanics, more specifically, turbulent multiple elliptic jets. She's passionate about teaching and is currently a sessional instructor for Intro to Thermal Science. Over to you, Ella. There we go. All right, so thanks for that introduction. Um, thank you for having me here. So my name is Ella Morris, and I will be giving a brief presentation on my research project, which is entitled Experimental Investigation of Mixing Characteristics of Multiple Elliptic Jets. All right, so here's an overview of my presentation today. So I'll start off with an introduction about myself. Um, I will then go over some of the background of my research topic. After that, I'll discuss my research project, both past and present, and then some of the ongoing research in the turbulence and hydraulics engineering lab. I'll then end off with a summary. All right, so during my undergraduate career, I was part of the engineering access program. So this is a program specifically for Indigenous students. During the beginning of my undergraduate, um, research and graduate program was not on my radar at all. It wasn't until I had the opportunity uh, to work as a summer research student with my now advisor, uh, Dr. Mark Tachi. So research was something I found that I really enjoyed. So after completing my undergrad in 2017, I made the decision to pursue a master's of science degree studying turbulent elliptic jets. So during my master's, I had the opportunity to travel to a conference in San Francisco and present my research. And near the end of my degree, I was offered a scholarship from NSERC to pursue a PhD. So I decided to take that opportunity and here I am today. So turbulent jets have been investigated for decades as they have diverse industrial and engineering applications. Some of these include fuel injection in propulsion systems, waste disposal and HVAC systems. So in HVAC system applications, for example, turbulent jets form the basis of analyzing and designing efficient induction and mixing jet ventilation systems. Large entrainment from the ambient fluid into the core jet is required for optimal performance of these ventilation systems. An example would be a type of ventilation system that would need to provide heating or cooling to a space while providing maximum occupant comfort as well as energy efficiency. So when designing such a ventilation system, induction nozzles have a key role and therefore their geometry, spacing and orientation are critical design parameters. So although research has been ongoing for decades, research uh, is needed to identify optimal nozzle configurations that maximize the induction and mixing between the core jets and the ambient fluid. So for this reason, Price Industries, which is a leading HVAC company in North America, has embarked on a collaborative research effort with the University of Manitoba to study the effects of nozzle geometry, nozzle spacing, and nozzle orientation on the mixing characteristics of turbulent jets. So which brings us to my research project. I'm investigating the effects of nozzle orientation on the mixing behavior of elliptic jets. So provided here is a schematic diagram of the triple jet configuration that is being investigated in my experiments. So each of the configurations has a spacing between the nozzles. So this spacing was chosen from a previous research project that studied the effects of nozzle spacing on mixing behavior. As you can see here, the nozzles are either oriented on what is called the major plane or the minor plane. So my research is to investigate what impact this variation of orientation has on the mixing of the jets. So on this slide is the experimental facility where I would run my experiments. So here's a picture of the water channel in the Turbulence and Hydraulics Engineering Laboratory at the University of Manitoba. So during the experiments, the water would be circulated through the water channel. The nozzles that I showed previously um, would be fixed at a location of the water channel and the water would flow through the nozzles and into the test section. 
Not seen on the picture, but a camera and a laser would be fixed on a traverse system and set up in such a way that it would capture the images of the flow. And I will discuss that in more detail next. So a particle image velocimetry system, also called a PIV system, is used to conduct velocity measurements. So the PIV is a whole field, non-intrusive velocity measurement system that provides instantaneous velocity vectors simultaneously at numerous positions within the flow field. So the PIV system consists of three main components, which includes a laser, a camera, and a data acquisition system. The way it works is a seeding particle is selected and added to the fluid. So in my case, it would be water. Since the PIV measures the velocity of the particles and not the fluid velocity, it is uh, crucial to use the right seeding particle. So the seeding particles are used to trace the flow and it is important that they are small enough to follow the flow faithfully, but large enough to scatter the light to the camera. So as the water flows the through the test section, the flow is illuminated by a laser sheet, which you can see on the slide there. So the camera, which is placed outside the test section, captures the images during the experiment. So the blue arrows on the diagram represent the flow going through the test section. So here's a short video of the laser beam illuminating um, the seeding particles as the water flows through the channel. So isn't that neat? It kind of reminds me of the matrix. So after the images are captured in an experiment, they're then analyzed using computer software to extract the information needing to analyze the flow. So presented here on the slide is a sample of some contour plots from my uh, research project. So these are uh, plots of the streamwise mean velocity flow of the triple jets configuration that I showed earlier. So these plots are used to provide a qualitative analysis of the flow. Now, because there's symmetry um, about the middle jet, only the top half of the plots are shown here. So what you can't see is the bottom jet. So in here, it's just the middle and the top. So these contour plots show that there are significant differences in spreading of the flow. So for instance, if you look at figure A, it has a greater spreading for both jets. This is an indication of higher rate of mixing of the jets with the surrounding fluid. Another point of interest is the location at which the jets begin to merge together, which is another indication of higher mixing efficiency. Um, so as can be seen here from figure A, it has the closest merging point location between the jets. And therefore, in this region, looking at these plots, um, we can conclude that the nozzle configuration in figure A displays uh, superior mixing behavior. So in my previous project, I used a planar PIV system with a maximum sampling rate of 15 Hertz. For this reason, it was impossible to obtain all three velocity components and temporally resolve the velocity. So therefore for my PhD project, I am going to be using a high resolution, two dimensional, two component tomographic time resolved PIV system. So, this consists of a high repetition rate laser source, high speed camera, and data acquisition system to conduct the velocity measurements. So, this measurement technique is the key in gaining a complete understanding of the complex nature of the nozzle orientation effects on the elliptic multiple jets and it hasn't be done, been done before. So I'm currently in the beginning stages of designing my experiment and I anticipate to begin later this year. So here's a, an interesting project that is going on right now in the Turbulence and Hydraulics Engineering Laboratory and it is studying the effects of rectangular cylinders on uniform flow. So the first figure shows a diagram of the test section with the cylinder placed midway. What is being studied here is interaction between the separated shear layer emanating from the leading edge and the near wake region of bluff bodies. So the height of the rectangular cylinders is kept constant while the streamwise extents are varied. And as you can see from the figure, the cylinder spanned the entire width of the water channel, ensuring a two-dimensional flow at the mid span of the test section. 
So a sample contour plot is also provided here to help visualize the flow behavior. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. So here are just some key points. So again, my research project is part of a greater collaborative research effort between the University of Manitoba and Price Industries. And I'm building off my master's research project, which is studying the effects of nozzle orientation on the mixing behavior of multiple elliptic jets. In my previous project, I was able to study the spatule evolution of the flow, but now using the time-resolved tomographic PIV system, I can now investigate the temporal evolution of the flow. And lastly, some interesting research that is being conducted in the Turbulence and Hydraulics Engineering Lab is studying the effects of rectangular cylinders in a uniform flow. All right, and that concludes my presentation. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Ella. So uh, I'm curious, is this mostly theoretical research or are there practical applications to say, uh, studying three jets and the orientation of the nozzles or for the rectangular cylinders? Um, yeah, so this is a, the, it's a collaborative effort, research effort with Price Industries. So uh, the research that I conduct, like it, it adds to the database of knowledge um, for other researchers, but it's also can be used by Price when they're designing their nozzles for their HVAC systems. Okay, so there is indeed a, a practical application yeah. in the mix here. How about the rectangular cylinder? The rectangular cylinder. So I am. Um, so that's something that's being done by another graduate student. So I, I believe it's, you know, in collaboration with Price, but I'm not too sure. Okay. Uh, so the first question we have is why was water used as the test fluid if the experiment has applications in space? Okay, so for my master's research project, um, I actually did my uh, experiments in an air chamber. So we're able to use different fluids. So for my master's, it was um, an air chamber. So the fluid was air. And then going forward with uh, my PhD project, it's gonna be water. So because it's based on what's called a Reynolds number, uh, it doesn't, we can interchain interchange the, the fluid. Okay, great. Are there other questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, so maybe I'll ask another one about the, uh, the PIV system. So how, how small are these particles that you, you put in the water and, and what are they made of? Um, so for my master's projects, I used olive oil droplets. So it was uh, 10 micrometers diameter. So uh, it was actually an olive oil vapor. So it wasn't, um, I used a aerosol generator. So it created this vapor of olive oil droplets. Um, in other, it's uh, mercury spheres. Okay, great, thanks. All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. I'll maybe wait a few more seconds here. Oh, there we go. What challenges, if any, have you overcome in your academic studies? Um, well, I have, I've had many challenges. So I, I have four children. <laughs> so I guess time management would be one of the challenges. Um, so I've, throughout my academic career, I've been having a family. So it's just finding that balance of, you know, being present at home, but also being able to focus on my research. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Ella, for your, for your talk and for participating yeah. in SETDAY 2021. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye. So, uh, our final set day presenter today is Miss Rachel Nickel, and her study is entitled Using Sharp Magnetic Nanoparticles for Biofilm Destruction. Rachel is a Vanier, Vanier Scholar in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the Faculty of Science under the supervision of Johan van Leer. She received her BSc and MSc from the University of Manitoba and is currently working on her PhD. 
She studies magnetic nanoparticles with a particular focus on biomedical applications. So over to you, Rachel. Hi. Okay. So I'm here to talk. Oh, I should share my screen. Sorry, guys. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm here to talk to you about using sharp magnetic nanoparticles for biofilm destruction. So for my introduction, I am a physics student. It's not entirely reflected in this presentation, but if you have questions about the physics about the nanoparticles, please feel free to ask me. Okay, but we'll move on to the presentation. So today I'm gonna to talk a bit about biofilms and magnetic nanoparticles first, and our strategy on how we're going to use these sharp particles and optimize the system so that we can eradicate biofilms. Also touch a little bit about where I see this work heading, um, but we're gonna keep this pretty to the point, I think. So, biofilms. Biofilms form when you get bacteria or other microbes that stick to a surface and then start building their own structure. So they produce this extracellular matrix, which if you look at this lovely SEM image here, is like a gluey net of gunk. And if you see one in person, it looks like slime. If you have like plaque on your teeth or you have slimy rocks in a stream, that's all biofilm. Now what I'm looking at is bacterial biofilms, particularly the stuff that grow on like catheter tubes and endoscopy tubes. So reusable medical devices where it's really, really important to sanitize. So in a biofilm, the bacteria reproduce really quickly and the film grows pretty thick. And the matrix is beneficial to it because it helps insulate it from other changes to the environment and it actually protects it from antibiotics. Now, the dense matrix does prevent oxygen and nutrients from getting all the way through to the deepest bacteria. So the bacteria at the bottom of the biofilm become latent. So they're not reproducing and they're not even necessarily respiring, which means that they're very, very hard to kill. So conventional treatments, we would apply an antibacterial chemical just to the surface. So it's mixing in the fluid where the biofilm is and the bacteria in the first few layers of the biofilm will die. But because either the bacteria, the antibacterial can't reach the bottom bacteria or the bottom bacteria aren't metabolizing and processing the antibacterial, they survive and you end up getting a full repopulation of the biofilm, which is a major problem and can cause infections. So our way around it is to look at magnetic nanoparticles. So the particles that I'm interested in are iron oxide. So these are ultra tiny. So you can get about 100 or 10,000 nanoparticles that fit in the width of a single human hair. So I actually have a vial of them here. So I'm gonna make a screen of it. Okay, so what's exciting about this is that we can manipulate them with magnetic fields. So I don't know if you can see, I have a very, very tiny magnet here. But if I move it along the bottom of the vial, thank you, you can see that the particles actually respond really well. So I'm gonna tip it again. So the idea is we should be able to use these particles and drag it through the biofilm. And then if we move it around with a magnetic field, we can actually scrape the film off. The problem with this is they're non-toxic which is fantastic if we're looking at applications like drug delivery and hyperthermia, which are options for how this research could be going. But if we wanna kill bacteria, we, we need something else. So we wanna combine our nanoparticles with a biocide in order to prevent regrowth. So our strategy is we're gonna coat the particles with this biocide, which kills everything, it's not selective. And we're gonna use the magnetic field to drag it through the film so we're physically disrupting it, moving the magnet around to scrape it off, and the biocide will be able to kill any remaining bacteria. So what we want to look at is how can we maximize the amount of biocide that we get on these particles? Because the more biocide we get on, the less particles we'll need to treat effectively. So how do we load a biocide on? 
So what we've chosen to use is CTAB. It's cetyl trimethyl and ammonium bromide, and it's a surfactant. So it's basically like soap, just like if you were mixing oil and water together, it doesn't really mix. But if you add soap, you get these little micelles. So the soap coats little droplets of oil and helps mix it with water. We're gonna use the same thing. So the particles, once they're synthesized, are kind of oily because of oleic acid tails. And we're gonna use the C-tab, which interdigitates. So it, the tails mix in with the tails of the oleic, and it actually makes it hydrophilic. So our particles that only suspended in like a oily fatty solution now go into water. And the positively charged C-tab heads all point to the outside of the particle. So this is the ideal position to kill bacteria because it's that positively charged head that's really effective. So how will we maximize it? And this is where the sharp particles come in. So a lot of my focus is looking at how different shapes of nanoparticles could possibly work together or could be optimized. So here we are looking at spheres, uh, cubes, and tetrapods. So the tetrapods are like a four-sided pyramid. And the shapes all have different surface area and edge quality. So we're looking to see what's the best way that we can get the most biocide on. And this is just to give information about how we can improve things in the future and what parameters we're going to want to be tuning. tuning. So we loaded the particles with biocide. And to check how much was on it, we did thermogravimetric analysis. So we put a little bit of sample into a very, very hot, strong furnace that's attached to a balance. And we're measuring how much mass comes off as the temperature goes up. And you can see the spheres had almost no mass loss. The cubes had a decent amount and the tetrapods had quite a lot. So we're looking at the mass loss between 150 and 250 Celsius because that's the range associated with CTAP. Um, the further mass, lo mass loss is due to oleic acid and other stuff coming off. So from this we know the spheres have very little biocide, which was rather surprising, and the cubes and the tetrapods show significant loading. So we did our biofilm test. So we used the same amount of particles, so every biofilm was treated with 10 milligrams of particles, and we used it against MRSA, so methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus biofilms. If you look at the picture here, I have an SEM, and they're basically little balls that are very closely packed. So the sphere results, we are roughly the same as if we treated it just with nanoparticles alone. So if we didn't worry anything about biocide, we killed about 10 to the power of seven bacteria. So 10 million on the range reduction. If you look at here, I have an SEM image of the dish after the spheres were after the sphere treatment, and there's only a handful of bacteria that were left. I would have had a picture of the cubes and tetrapods, but it killed it completely. So we know that the cubes and the tetrapods are more effective at killing bacteria, which is not surprising at all, because we also know that those samples had more biocide in it. So more biocide kills more bacteria. Why did I do this research? Well, there are other useful insights that we can pull off of it. So from a simple expectation, we would think that biocide loading would increase as our surface area increases. So biocide attaches to the surface, more surface equals more biocide. But we got almost nothing on the spheres. And if we model the nanoparticles, so we took the average size and calculated what an average surface area would be, what the average edge length would be, and we found that our biocide loading corresponds almost exactly to the amount of edges on our shapes. And this tells us that the C-tab is actually attracted to the edges more than surfaces. And this is because of electrostatic interactions. So just like you have a lightning rod, which is going to be attracting electricity, our corners and edges, so the sharp parts of our, bios, of our nanoparticles, 
are actually attracting biocides. So this is very exciting. So moving forward, we're looking at different shapes that either have more edges, such as octopods or sharp cubes, and incorporating high field magnetic field, AC fields, which actually cause the magnetic moments to vibrate back and forth and the nanoparticles heat. And these can get incredibly hot. I think we did a trial run and accidentally melted our little biofilm dishes. So these are all kind of directions that we could be looking for our work to be headed. Now, quick thank yous. Um, my supervisor, Johan van Lerup, has been invaluable in this project, as well as the other students who have helped out um, with doing this work, as well as Dr. Song Liu's lab in biosystems engineering, because he's been uh, helping coordinate everything. And big thanks to funding from the FANU program. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that, uh, Rachel. So I'm, I'm going to start by uh, asking the question I always used to ask when I was the Dean of Grad Studies and I was chairing a PhD defense. And that is, uh, I, I, I don't know how close to the end you are, but if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently and why? Oh, gosh. Because it's always a bit of a meandering path, right, to uh, kind of get to, <laughs> get to the end of your PhD. Yeah, so I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, I love the lab I'm in. I love what I get to do every day. I spend a lot of my time actually making nanoparticles. So the samples that you've seen pictured, the cubes, the tetrapods, the octopods, I've made all those. And I, I love it. I love the flexibility to choose what I'm going to study. And I honestly wouldn't have done much differently. Okay, well, that's 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 a great answer, and that's great to know. So the first question from our audience is, how do you sort the different shapes of nanoparticles from one another? Oh, tough question. Okay, so these are actually so you cool. clearly don't do it by the uh, by hand. <laughs> <laughs> so what's cool about these nanoparticles are they're actually all synthesized almost exactly the same way. So I make this iron oleate, which is like a waxy gunk, and it gets mixed in with a solvent and either two drops of oleic acid or like a tiny pinch, there's actual measurements, of sodium oleate. And it's heated up to 320 degrees Celsius and they precipitate out. If everything is beautifully well controlled, you'll get most of the shapes almost identical. So it's very, very easy to get nice spheres. Um, the ones in this talk were not my best, but it's a lot harder to get other shapes like tetrapods and cubes. So you try to control all the variables. And then when I go to get the transmission electron microscope image, it's literally a holding your breath moment just before the, the valve opens and you see the picture of what will I get today? So as controlled as everything can be, um, it's not necessarily sorting so much as a pre is a planned approach. Um, there are attempts. So I showed you my nanoparticle jar. So you can separate out if you have different shapes that are going to be different sizes. So if I know I'm going to be getting large cubes and like I have some small spheres that creep in, you can separate them out to the side. So the larger nanoparticles will stick higher up and you can actually wash away the small ones. So you can sort of size and shape select that way, but it really is kind of a predefined synthesis. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, another question. In the future, can nanoparticles be used to treat cancer? <gasps> oh, you fed me a lovely question. Okay, so what I was talking about earlier with hyperthermia, where you have these tiny magnetic nanoparticles and a high frequency AC field, and it causes it to vibrate back and forth. So there's currently research underway, and we're interested in it as well, for hyperthermia treatments for cancer treatments, where nanoparticles are injected either into the tumor or near the tumor, and possibly guided to it with other magnetic fields. So you want to get them as close as possible. And then you can use this high frequency, oh, words are hard, high frequency field to cause them to heat. And if you can get it, the sweet spot is like between 
45 and 60 degrees Celsius, you can cause heat death for tumor cells and it doesn't harm normal cells as much because tumor cells tend to be more thermally um, sensitive because they're reproducing much more quickly. So that is currently underway. I know there's been studies for both prostate cancer and glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor, um, that have shown success. So it's very exciting. Um, nanoparticles have also been studied for drug delivery applications. So I'm looking at it for surface, but if you load drugs onto the particles and apply a frequent, high frequency field that cause it to heat and release is another kind of approach that's going on. Okay, great. Next question. What do you plan to do when you complete your PhD? Oh. Okay, so I still have two years left. So I have time to make decisions. Um, I am looking at going into research. I love what I do and I love the flexibility I have to go in and discover something new every day. So every day I have the opportunity to do something that hasn't been done. And there's not many jobs that let you do that. So I, I think I might be headed down the research track, yeah. Okay, great. I'm not seeing any additional questions at this time, but uh, maybe I'll, we'll give it another 30 seconds here and see if there are any last questions before we call it a day. And it looks like that may be it. So thank you, Rachel, for an interesting talk. And thank you for participating in Set Day 2021. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye now. All right, so that does take us to the, to the end uh, this morning. I hope you have enjoyed uh, Set Day 2021. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for participating. I'd like to thank the Set Day presenters. Um, and. Uh, it was great having you with us, and I enjoyed being able to participate and, and field the, the questions. So thank you uh, for your questions, and, and thank you for being with us uh, this morning. We'll see what next year brings, but hopefully we will be uh, back uh, for an in-person uh, set day 2022 uh, on the University of Manitoba campuses. That concludes set day 2021. Stay safe, stay warm, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Miigwech.